um, and how it has an impact on professional development as well as uh, you know what are the business benefits of TOGAF. So before um, we go ahead, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Nilotpal Das. People usually prefer to call me just Neil. Neil is a, a nickname that I was given many, many years ago. I'm an architect, I'm a speaker, and I'm a writer. Writer as in, uh, you know, I'm, I've not written books or anything, but I uh, write these letters, I write uh, a blog, and, and, and I write uh, articles and white papers and what have you. I, I write about enterprise architecture, I write about TOGAF, I also write about uh, business IT, IT strategy, business strategy, uh, uh, leadership, and what have you. Uh, my background, I started my career about 16 years ago and uh, I started as a programmer. I became a, a senior program, programmer and then a technical programmer, a technical lead and then technical architect. Uh, and then quite early in my career actually I got an opportunity as an enterprise architect in a financial services organization. I've worked there for uh, about five years. I've learned about enterprise architecture. We have some enterprise architecture practice there. And then I decided that uh, it was time to change gears. My profile was mostly towards the application architecture side at that time, at that point in time. And my uh, career was also heavily focused on a financial services side. So I was either working for a financial services organization all my career until at that point in time, or um, some organization that was associated to financial services in some way. Like, for example, I have worked for Kenbay, uh, which was a services company primarily uh, catering to the financial services businesses. Uh, I have also worked for Microsoft, but in the licensing, pricing, uh, and operations division, which is primarily related to, you know, uh, finance at Microsoft. And then uh, I worked for a financial services company. So. I did think that there were two things that I needed to do. One was uh, I needed to get out of the application architecture domain and I needed to gather more in, um, experience around uh, infrastructure architecture to balance out my career a little bit because it was getting lopsided. And I, did, I needed more domain knowledge, more uh, experience on other domains besides financial services. So I now work, work, for, a finan uh, work for a pharmaceutical organization, pharmaceutical and healthcare, organization. I also consult with uh, Knowledge Hut uh, um, as far as uh, enterprise architecture is concerned, enterprise architecture in TOGAF is concerned. So that's a little bit about me. The agenda today is uh, as follows. So we have, uh, we will talk about change, all right, because enterprise architecture is essentially about change. If uh, the industry and the, str and, and the IT uh, landscape of any organization would have remained stagnant, would have remained same over a period of time, then we would not require enterprise architecture. But unfortunately or fortunately or whatever you may call it, um, change is all pervasive. So we'll talk about all pervasive change and how it affects us and how it affects businesses. We'll talk about innovation and what is the role that innovation plays in the competitive uh, industry today and how innovation can be leveraged to, uh, to beat the competition. We'll talk about the role of agility. Why do we need to be agile and how agility helps organizations and businesses um, in getting better and better every passing day. And then we'll talk about the role of enterprise architecture for agility and innovation. So we, uh, we will bind everything together, right? We've talked about change, we'll talk about innovation, agility, we'll talk about enterprise architecture and how are agility and innovation. And then we'll uh, come to the core of the subject, which is TOGAF, uh, the role of the TOGAF framework to do enterprise architecture. And then we'll see the role of TOGAF certification and how it can help you in your professional development. Okay, And then we'll open it up for any discussions. The world is changing. Okay, what you see on the screen is the Christopher Scholl's uh, typewriter. Uh, this typewriter was this typewriter went into production in, in 1868, if I'm not wrong, 1868. It was the industrial era and uh, uh, people wanted to be, a, wanted the capability to be able to type out letters rather quickly, okay? Um, so this went into manufacturing, but this was not the first typewriter. 
the typewriter was actually invented in the 1570s, okay, 300 years ago. 300 years before the Christopher Scholz typewriter, which went into manufacturing, okay. 300 years of uh, time to market, 300 years of a product being invented for the first time and then it going into mass manufacturing and production, okay. 300 years. What you see on the other side of the screen is Steve Jobs demonstrating the iPhone. It was um, it went into design phase in 1995 and it uh, went into manufacturing in 1998. Three years, okay. On one hand, you have the Christopher Scholz typewriter, which took 300 years to go into manufacturing. On the other hand, you have iPhone, which went into manufacturing within three years. And this typewriter has, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, iPhone is more capable than the first spaceship that went to moon, that landed on moon. So the times are changing. There used to be a time when you could be uh, lax about how fast you go into manufacturing. When once the business comes to IT and says, this is what we are looking for. And then IT would say, okay, let me go and figure out how I'm going to build it. And then it would take somewhere around 7 to 11 months, depending upon the complexity of the application or what have you. And it would come back and say, here you go, this is what we've built. And the customer says, well, we wanted this 11 months ago. We don't need it anymore because the business landscape has changed. And, and the business landscape is also getting more and more dynamic. If you think about it, uh, there used to be a time when organizations used to grow organically. What I, when I say organically, what I mean is um, naturally. So the business would basically, you know, manufacture good products, market good products, and um, more and more customers would start buying it, and the and the and the manufacturing capacity needs to expand. So, you know, they would basically buy more machinery, get more automation, get more people to work on it, and then. Uh, the marketing team needs to expand because now the manufacturing capacity has increased and, and that's organic growth, okay? The organization slowly grows. More people come into the picture, more machines come into the picture, more, mar more uh, marketing capacity comes into the picture, uh, more systems come into the picture and so on. This is organic growth. Today we don't have organic growth. Today we have inorganic growth. One of the good ways of how, one of the ways of how uh, organizations grow these days is by mergers and acquisitions. So think about it. I used to work for Canbay um, and uh, Canbay got acquired by Capgemini and overnight Canbay went from 6,000 people to 65,000 people, okay? It became Capgemini and, and uh, Microsoft acquired Nokia and, and so what happens is overnight you have now acquired thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people depending upon the, the size of the merger. What this does is it the, the, the scale of change now is not slow and progressive. It used to be slow and progressive when there was organic growth, but today we have inorganic growth. We have mergers and acquisitions that change the size, the business, the nature of the products, the uh, the landscape essentially, okay, overnight. So the, the changes are drastic and they are big. And the only way forward is through innovation. We will have to innovate. We will have to come up with newer and newer ways, not only to uh, accept the change that is happening, large and drastic changes that are happening, but also to launch new products because uh, the, the organizations are getting more and more competitive. Okay. Seth Godin has written a book called uh, The Public Hour where he says that uh, there used to be a time when people used to, uh, you know, uh, so, so he gives the example of a purple cow. He says that if you're driving in uh, the prairies of France, it, it looks very beautiful. The landscape is absolutely beautiful. The green pastures and the cows grazing and all of that. But what happens is uh, after a while, you get bored. All right, and, and because cows grazing on the green pastures is actually quite a boring sight. It's very slow and it doesn't change much. So you get bored. And the next time you notice a cow is when a purple colored cow comes along. 
because it's something that you haven't seen until now. It's something unique. The amount of time that it takes for customers to get bored these days has shortened. There used to be a time when we used to buy things that we needed and then uh, television came along and newspapers came along and then internet came along and now we have smart devices and apps and what have you and, and the amount of information that is overloaded on the customer these days is huge. It's unprecedented. And the customer cannot keep on looking at one thing for too long. Every two years or two or three years we have a new iPhone, a new Android phone, a new Windows phone and we have to get rid of the old one otherwise you know we are left out or we are getting bored. So we have to come up with newer and newer ways of pushing our products, of making our products innovative to, to uh, meet the customer needs. And that is why innovation is important. Now the two pictures that you see, the one on the left and the one on the right, they are both uh, symbolizing innovation. The only difference is the one on the left is a bolt from the blue. What it means is either you could depend on the bolt from the blue, you could wait till somebody comes up with a genius idea and then you implement the idea and become famous. But then what if it doesn't? And, and the problem with that model is that somebody is the one you have to depend on, right? Hero worship. The one that you see on the right symbolizes uh, organized innovation. Organized innovation essentially means that you don't just wait for ideas to come to you, you create a process, you uh, set up a method by which you can innovate um, in a systematic way. Okay, so, uh, so, so don't, wait, don't, don't wait for the bolt from the blue, don't depend on somebody who's a genius to give you intelligent ideas. Manufacture innovation is what I'm trying to say. Now, how do agility and innovation associate with each other? First of all, let's talk about uh, what innovation is. Innovation is large and disruptive change. It's not small changes that you do every day. And uh, uh, these large and innovative and disruptive changes change the entire business landscape. You know, uh, they, they change the way you do business. To give you an example, in the old days, um, people used to, uh, I mean, pharmaceutical organizations manufacture drugs, okay? Uh, they, uh, to manufacture drugs, they have to come up with newer drugs every other day. And what they do is they do clinical trials first, all right? They test the efficacy. There are two things that you need to test when you are developing a new drug. One is the efficacy of the drug, and the second is whether there are any side effects of the drug, okay? Uh, any, um, uh, you know, si unwanted side effects of the drug. So uh, these are the two things that you do when you are doing testing. So the first thing that you do is clinical trials where you test the efficacy of the drug. You take the drug, put it in a petri dish, you take the hormone that basically is generated in your body when you experience pain, you put it into the petri dish, you see how it reacts. I'm just giving you a very, very vague example. I'm not really a, a, a techie when it comes to drugs manufacturing and researching, but I'm just giving you an example that you test the drug out in a laboratory. Once that is done, animal testing is done. Okay. Um, once animal testing is completed and you find out that yes, the drug is efficacious, then you do human trials. And there are stringent processes that are in place for pharmaceutical organizations, there are regulatory bodies that look at all these kind of things um, um, to make sure that the, the drugs are ready for human trial, all right? So, the human trials were the most challenging because let's say, for example, you're testing out a drug for heart attack or, or cardiac arrest. Um, so what you do, what you do, you look for volunteers and people who are who've had a heart attack before and are expecting another one. They would volunteer for the drug because it's a good drug. If it's an efficacious drug, it could uh, you know save their life. So they volunteer. Now, let's say that there's a volunteer and he gets a heart attack. According to the process, he should be calling up the right hospital. Okay, first of all, and uh, uh, telling them that he's a, a heart patient and he's also a volunteer for the drug. Now, when the person actually gets a heart attack, it's a life and death situation, he does not remember to do that. So they take him to uh, uh, whichever hospital is nearby and they start 
administering any number of drugs which basically are not the drug that you're trying to test. And then they realize that, oh, this, this patient is actually a volunteer. And then you start administering the right kind of drugs. And then you start testing. But there's so many um, uh, elements in this whole process where it disturbs the, it doesn't isolate the environment. It, it disturbs the entire environment and doesn't give you the right results. So what they have started doing now, and this is innovation, right, large and disruptive change. What they've started doing now is they've given an iPhone to the, to the volunteer. And uh, they've given uh, the volunteer a wearable, a watch, a watch that will essentially track the pulse rate and, and make sure that everything is all right. In case if the watch track, uh, finds out that he's having a heart attack, right, he or she, okay, it will automatically use the data connection in the iPhone and, and alert the right authorities. The ambulance will be on the way before even the patient knows that he's getting a heart attack. Now that is changing the landscape drastically, okay, innovating and, you know, changing the way the pharmaceutical, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical and healthcare organizations do business. So in the old days, we, the business used to come to us and tell us that this is what I want and we used to take 11 months to develop what they want and give it to them. Today, IT organizations go to the business and tell them that, well, we have this capability it is going to change the way you do business. You are going to have to adapt to that, but it's going to make things better. And that is the power of innovation, okay? The question is, is the organization agile enough? Because innovations are large and drastic changes, okay? The picture that you see on the right-hand side is the aliens from the alien movie, uh, Xenomorph, they used to call them. The name of this animal is xenomorph because it morphs depending upon the environment that it is born in. So if it's born in Earth, it would breathe the uh, you know oxygen, nitrogen atmosphere and it would survive. If it is born on some other planet, whatever atmosphere it is in, it's a science fiction concept. What I'm trying to say is it's considered to be one of the most powerful species in the universe in that, in that uh, mythology because it morphs. And it is the same in the businesses today. The organizations that morph, the organizations that are agile enough to change themselves to suit the changing business landscape are the ones that are going to be the most competitive, the, the most, uh, you know, profit-making. Innovation requires agility. You cannot change things overnight if you're not agile, okay? Let's say that you're launching a new product. Let's say, let's take the example that I just gave you, all right? Let's say you want to do real-world evidence. You want to um, give your volunteer patients uh, iPhones so that they can inform the authorities at the right time so that they can be administered the right drug and their monitoring process begins way ahead of time, uh, way before they reach the hospital. That will give you better results about what the patient is doing or how the patient is reacting to the drugs or what he's going through and all that. So there are so many variables to this. Is the organization, first of all, ready to accept that change? Would the, uh, uh, the, the healthcare providers be ready to accept that technology, to be able to administer the drugs at the right time? Would they be able to respond to the alert that would be sent to them? Would the ambulance dispatch at the appropriate time? And all of that, and, and to implement these changes, first of all, you will have to know your organization properly. You will have to know what is where, who is responsible for what, what are the various service lines you have, what are the various business functions that you have within the organization. All these business functions come together and form an organization, but we don't have that today. Majority of the organizations that I know of, and I'm not talking about small organizations, I'm talking about large, complex, uh, a Fortune 500 profit-making kind organizations that are so complex and, and that, that they cannot adapt quickly. And the reason, primarily, is because they have grown inorganically. They, are, they were not ready for the change when the change happened. When they acquired an organization, they did, um, they did integrate somehow, you know, both the organizations did morph into each other and as some kind of rework happened. But there are still pockets of isolated 
sections within the organization which nobody knows about. And, and it happens all over the place. There are systems that cannot talk to each other. There is data that flows but not through the entire system. There are no ways that, no platforms that can give you comprehensive information about what is happening in which part of the section. There are redundancies, there are duplications, and so many different things that cause, that become obstacles in agility. Agility, though, fosters innovation. If you know the impact of large and drastic changes, large and disruptive changes, you wouldn't fear the large and disruptive changes. We fear the change because we don't know how we are going to react to it. We don't know what is going to be the impact of that change in our lives, in our organizations, in our businesses. Knowledge reduces risk. Knowledge removes fear. And agility is that knowledge, okay? And so agility fosters innovation. So that's the whole concept in this slide. Know thyself. Knowledge of the enterprise helps the study the impact of the large and disruptive changes that innovation brings. And that knowledge fosters enterprise agility because now you are ready to accept change. Agility fosters innovation. Enterprise architecture is the architecture of the enterprise, okay? Now, there are many, many different definitions of enterprise architecture around, you know, in the industry on if you, if you, uh, you know, do an internet search on what enterprise architecture is, you'll find so many different, you know, definitions. If you look at job descriptions that say enterprise architecture, there are so many different job descriptions about it. Some say, you know, enterprise architecture is, uh, you know, an architect who works on enterprise applications. Some say an enterprise architect is somebody who is an extremely experienced, really, really senior architect, okay? And some people say enterprise architect is God because they want him to do project management, they want to lead teams, they want to be an expert in, you know, technologies, they want to be an expert in business, domain, and, 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 and what have you. I mean, they expect the enterprise architect to be a God. But enterprise architecture is not all of that. Enterprise architecture is the architecture of the enterprise. I mean, you may define it as many ways you want to, but in this context that we are presenting at this point in time, enterprise architecture is the architecture of the enterprise. Enterprise architecture fosters business agility, but what, because what you do in enterprise architecture is study the enterprise. Go and look for, you know, the various, what are the various business functions and, and how they align with the various systems and applications and what are the applications that are owned by various business functions and, and how does the data flow between the various enterprise applications within the enterprise and, and what is the technology platform that supports these applications and this data that is flowing through the enterprise. Once you understand how your enterprise is organized, Okay, how there are various business functions and lines of businesses and people and, and processes and tools and technologies and all of that. Once you understand the entire landscape, it's easy for you to change things because now you know what is connected to what. And if you move this object right here, it's going to you know, affect these uh, different objects around you know, the landscape. It's like beads on a thread. You hold a bead and start pulling the thread and all the beads that are connected to that thread come along with it. That gives you a higher level perspective of our organization and about the changes that, are good, that you're going to have to go through to accept the change. Impact analysis is understood and enterprise architecture fosters business innovation. So once again, what is enterprise architecture? Like I said, there's a lot of confusion about what enterprise architecture is. Some, some confuse it with technical architect, uh, some confuse it with social architect, and some confuse it with engineering manager, right? Enterprise architecture is the architecture of the em enterprise embodied in its components, okay? And this is a very, very functional definition that I'm giving you. Uh, it can be applied anywhere you want to. There are various components. It can be applied to construction architecture, for example. Okay, construction architecture is the architecture of the uh, of the buildings embodied in its components. So, what are the components of a building? There are walls, there are ceilings, there are rooms, there is elevator shafts, there is passageways, there is lawns, gardens, parking garage, what have you. Okay, these are the various components. The relationships with each other and the environment. So, think about it. Relationships within. 
How is the passageway connected to the elevator shaft? How is the passageway connected to the main door of the house? How is the door connected to the walls of the house? How is the electrical system connected to the, the city electrical system? How is the sanitation system connected to the plumbing system? And so on and so forth. So relationships within each other and the environment as a well, whole. Okay, so there is a city sanitation system which is the environment, and there's the building sanitation system. How are they connected? There's a city electrical system, and there is a building electrical system. How are they connected? And so on. And the principles of design and evolution. Now, this is a very important subject. We would not require architecture, especially in IT and enterprise, if things did not change. Architecture is about managing change, and the principles of design and evolution are essentially the principles, the core principles. Like, if you want to break a wall in a building and convert two small rooms into one big one, there are some core principles of stability that you will have to keep in mind. Okay, the building should not fall down. It's important that the building doesn't fall down because of the changes that you're making, and that is a principle of its design and evolution. Similarly, well, in construction or architecture. We don't change things must, much, and so uh, change is not the primary driver of design in construction architecture, but in enterprise architecture, in, in business architecture, in IT architecture, things change almost every day. Every day new technologies are coming, every day new business uh, uh, partnerships are happening, new products are being launched, and so change is one of the most important things that we focus on. So how do we f design our enterprise in such a way that tomorrow if I want to change something, it should be easy for me, it should be safe for me, it should not break other things. Those are the principles of its design and evolution. So again, enterprise architecture is the architecture of the enterprise embodied in its components, the relationships within and with the environment, and the principles of its design and evolution. That is the true definition of enterprise architecture. It is an advisory role. Okay. Now, Jack Welch, the CEO of uh, uh, General Electric, actually was the first person who envisioned or who said that uh, strategic leaders within organizations are every day taking uh, long-term strategic decisions without the knowledge that they need to take those decisions. Every day they are they're practically driving blind. They don't have the information that they need and this is happening because the data is stored in pockets within the organization, isolated pockets that do not talk to each other. If you want comprehensive information about your entire enterprise, there is no platform that provides this. And, and Jack Welch introduced the idea for the first time called Boundaryless Organizations, which has been taken up by the Open Group, by the way, as a mission. Okay. Business intelligence for strategic reasons. We require this business intelligence about how systems talk to each other for taking strategic decisions. The advisory role is seat at the strategy table. If you do not have a street at the a seat at the strategy table, enterprise architecture does not make sense. There are two aspects of the enterprise architecture job. Now, we are coming to the, to, the, to the business. We've talked about why enterprise architecture is necessary. Now, we'll talk about you know, why, what kind of work does an enterprise architect does. Okay. So, architect the strategy. Okay. This is the interesting part. Okay. As an enterprise architect, you provide business intelligence for future-proofing your enterprise. Tomorrow, oh, you know, so for example, what, what are the technologies that are coming in? So cloud is new, mobility is new, analytics is new, predictive analytics is coming, you know, and, and, and uh, what else? Um, yeah, cloud, mobility, analytics, uh, social, and, and these are the common ones that we all have uh, heard about so many times. And so this is future-proofing. Enterprise architect understands those technologies and understands how you can leverage these technologies to make your business smarter. The enterprise architect helps the senior management build business and IT strategies based on not just this, but also understanding the business as a whole. All right? He provides guidance on forward-looking strategies. So he sits right there with the CEO. He doesn't wait for the CEO to come to him and tell him that this is what we want to do. He rather looks into the business and tells the CEO, the CIO, the CMO, CFO, what have you, 
that this is how technology or IT can enable the business to get better, more innovative, smarter, and so on. The second part of the job is the draftsman's job, all right? So my father is a construction architect, and when, uh, uh, well, he's now retired, but he used to be a construction architect, and uh, he, well, what does a construction architect do? He talks to the customer, understands the requirements of what they want to build, whether it's a you know, residential building or it's a, a, a commercial complex or a residential complex or what have you, and then after understanding, he models it. All right, he, he, he creates designs of, uh, of the house, of whatever it is that it is that he's building. And then he shows those designs to the customer, making sure that, you know, is this what you really want? So the, so the models really are mock representations of the real thing that's coming, right? And so the customer says yes, and then there's a sign off, and there's the, the whole budgeting process and all of that. And my father's job doesn't end there, or the construction architect's job doesn't end there. He takes all of this information and he creates more models, models that the builder can understand or the building contractor can understand. He gives all these models to the building contractor and, and the contractor is the one who actually starts building the house. But this is not where uh, a construction architect's job ends. From time to time, my father, my father actually used to stand in the sun every day at the plot, okay? making sure that the construction is coming along just as he's designed it, all right? That is called governance. Now, this is the job of an architect, okay, at a higher level. Now, let's look at the enterprise architect role, okay? Higher level, talk to the senior management, we've already seen that, but there's also the, the grind, as I call it, okay? The modeler, the modeler knows the tools of the trade, okay? He's the one who's working on the tools, he's designing the models, he's now, to be a draftsman in construction architecture, you don't have to be a construction architect or a certified architect. You just can be a draftsman. There's something called an ITI certification that you can get to become a draftsman. An enterprise architectures or an enterprise architect's role starts as a draftsman. He must know the tools. He must know what modeling is. He must know how to build the models so that he can represent these models of the future technology systems applications that he's building, processes, you know, business processes and all that, so that he can show these models to the customer or the stakeholder organization or the businesses, like CMO, CFO and what have you, and they can see, oh, so this is what you're building. And then they can de define it and they can tell you changes in it and, and then you can take these models and go and build the systems that you're trying to build. Now, this is a higher level perspective. I'm not talking about each and every application and going inside it at a higher level. How are the applications talking to each other? How are the businesses talking to each other? How are the businesses leveraging these technologies? How is the data flowing through the system? And how can we make it better? Okay? The modeler is the one who enables the senior architect to do all this modeling. He's the draftsman. And unless you are a good draftsman, you cannot be a good enterprise architect. In fact, the ITI certification that I'm talking about is actually a subset of the architecture education. So when my father became a certified, uh, you know, construction architect, he also got the skills of modeling. And that's what, uh, you know, you need to have. That, that's the second part. It's not very interesting, to be very honest, all right? You have to work really hard at it. You have to build those models. But once you've built those models for a couple of years, it gives you a higher level understanding about the organization. It gives you an understanding about the strategies of the organization and you get prepared for the next level, which is the strategist. So TOGAF as an enterprise architecture framework. Let's look at that, okay? What you see on the right-hand side of the screen is the architecture development method, okay? And, and this method essentially helps us in building these models these models from various, various perspectives. Now, there are many enterprise architecture frameworks out there, but TOGAF is amazing because it doesn't just give you a framework to build those models, okay? It doesn't just give you the content framework uh, with the help of which you can build the models. It gives you a method of, you know, building, how do you start? Where do you start? If I, if you, if I give you a checklist of all the documents, would you be able to start doing enterprise architecture? Not really. You wouldn't know where to start. Right? So TOGAF gives you a phase-by-phase, step-by-step method. You know, this is where you start, this is what you do next, and then go here, and then do this, and so on and so forth. 
not only that, there are so many guidelines and techniques and reference models and reference architectures which are available as a part of the open group ecosystem that help an enterprise architect to get better at his job. TOGAF believes in business drives technology. So business architecture is at the core of TOGAF. Even if you look at the uh, ADM, after you've defined the architectural vision, which is essentially a higher level vision, you detail out the business architecture. You start looking at the various processes involved and various people involved and the goals and the objectives and the targets and what is it that you're trying to do, okay? How is it now and how is it going to be in the future? What is it that you would like to change, right? And then it looks at information systems architecture, technology architecture. So business architecture is at the absolute core because if you do not understand the business, you will not be able to do enterprise architecture. And then comes information systems architecture. Applications and data are essentially there in the organization to support it business. That is the only reason why you have business applications in an organization, right? And then comes technology architecture. So technology is basically, for, like for example, why do you need a LAN cable? so that applications can talk to each other ultimately, right? So LAN cable is technology architecture, right? A communications infrastructure is technology architecture. An operating system service, a data service, a, um, a virtualization service, cloud service, all of these are technologies that support larger business applications which can eventually support the business architecture. Now there are... Um, Now, now, what can you do with TOGAF? What is your roadmap? So TOGAF certification, once you've done TOGAF certification, you will understand the core modeling techniques and you will understand a method by which you can do uh, you know, enterprise architecture. The second step is future-proofing products. So you'll get into, um, um, you know, it, and I'm talking about, you know, there are many, many, many different kinds of uh, uh, organizations out there. There is, uh, uh, you know, product organizations. There are uh, services organizations, and then there are, um, um, you know, core businesses like financial services, banking, you know, healthcare, telecommunications, and what have you. So let's talk about the product business here. Enterprise architecture in the products business. Okay, like. Uh, there are many organizations that build products specifically for an industry, all right? So you could be working for Oracle, Microsoft, you could be working for um, uh, smaller organizations like Pfizer that, do, uh, that build products for financial services organizations and so on. So after you've done TOGAF certification, you will have a holistic understanding about the business. You could start future-proofing future products. You could build a product roadmap and get into product leadership, okay? In the IT business, okay, you can do TOGAF certification and learn enterprise architecture modeling. You get get into consulting. When I say IT business, I mean the services business, okay. Uh, uh, organizations like Accenture, um, Capgemini, Wipro, uh, um, there are also specialized enterprise architecture consulting organizations like uh, ICMG and Enterprise Architects and what have you. So you can do your TOGAF certification and then you can get into enterprise architecture modeling and then into consulting. You can start consulting um, uh, organiza other organizations, client organizations, organizations like let's say, you know, Gartner does consulting for you know, my organization, my previous organization, it used to do it. So that kind of work and then get into enterprise architecture leadership. Right, that's your career path in an, in a consulting environment, and then uh, enterprise architecture and core businesses or non IT businesses. Okay, this is the maximum potential that you have for enterprise architecture is in core businesses. So, a majority because enterprise architecture usually initially is outsourced to consulting organizations, but later on they are taken back. They build an enterprise architecture practice, a capability within the organization, and what you can do is after you've done the TOGAF certification, you can do enterprise architecture modeling. That is the first step always, all right? Enterprise architecture modeling. Become an enterprise architect and then eventually an IT leader. You could get into, get to become a CIO, and then eventually even a CEO if you're ambitious, okay? So that is your career path. Uh, enterprise architecture leads to uh, leadership, no matter which kind of organization you work in. <clears throat> the future of EA is that the future is EA. 
Okay. The times are changing, like I said. Okay. Um, I remember I was in my school days, and uh, the phone actually since the age uh, of five or six, I believe. Uh, I have seen the same kind of phone that we've been using in our house. Okay, the black colored dial phone that we used to use, and we used to, you know, dial a number and pick up the pick up the receiver and talk to people, and um, uh, that's pretty much it. That's all we could do. All right. Today, we have an ecosystem where we don't just have telephones. We have social. We have mobility. We have uh, data access. We have. Uh, we are connected at all times. My phone is connected to my watch, is connected to my uh, tablet, is connected to my laptop, which is connected to my desktop, and all this data is being stored on the cloud, and I can access it wherever I want to. I could control the slide deck from my watch if I wanted to. Okay. I'm just giving you a consumer example, but if you but think about it, I gave you a, a business example of uh, uh, you know how patients can use technology uh, or. or Businesses can use technology to enable the patients to help them do uh, human trials on, on drugs and, and uh, pharmaceutical products. Um, financial services organizations are now leveraging the social media and the uh, and crowdsourcing to you know do predictive analysis of how, on how the markets are going to be uh, responding uh, future in the future. The future of uh, of, of business is enterprise architecture because enterprise architecture can help you uh, uh, make your IT not only effective and efficient but 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 forward integration all right they can go ahead and talk to the business and help them support the business in the best possible manner because the business does not understand IT remember this okay when the business comes to you and tells you what they want they are looking at things very much from the business perspective they're not looking at things from the IT perspective, from the technology perspective. They do not completely understand the capabilities of what uh, you know IT and technology can provide them. But we understand the business at least at a level where we can help them. And we understand technology really well. So if we are there, and, and one more thing is that enterprise architecture is in, in, in its nascent stages in the industry today. It is growing. It's in its infancy. And the people who do enterprise architecture today, people who are prepared, okay, will have great opportunities tomorrow because very soon, um, if it hasn't already happened very soon, they, it will happen. They will, organizations will start realizing that they need enterprise architects. At that point in time, if you are a qualified, certified, and experienced enterprise architect out there, there is no limit or there is no boundaries to the number of opportunities that you will have in your career, in building a career, in, in getting into not only um, architecture leadership, but into IT leadership. That brings me to the end of my session, really, and I am pretty much on time. Uh, I will now open it up for any questions that you might have. Um, you can use your chat windows to ask me questions or the questions uh, section of your GoToWebinar, and I'd be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you, Sudhakar. Do you have a question for me? So there, there's a question from Sudhakar. He says, does it require a development background? No, it does not. Uh, it does require uh, an IT background. Uh, because you need to understand some things about IT, but it does not require a development background. You need to understand IT from a, I mean, the basic understanding of IT would help. Okay, I'm not saying that it is absolutely required. Okay, even a non-IT person can become an enterprise architect. But if you are from IT, it would be quicker, easier for you to understand the concepts of enterprise architecture. Now, which part of IT? It doesn't matter. You could be from uh, service management. You could be from infrastructure and like I said it is actually helpful if your portfolio is diversified 
So I was from the application background or, or development background. I actually moved into the uh, infrastructure background so that I have a higher level understanding of enterprise architecture. You know, I have a higher level understanding of how IT functions. Okay. Right. Uh, Faisal has a question. He says, if you do, uh, for example, Cisco certification, you also have to do some real-time exercises. Does TOGA certification also come in a in the same way, or is it only study level and practical working after the certification? Good question. Uh, there are two levels of TOGAS certification, level one and level two. <laughs> level, one cert level one certification exam is mostly multiple choice, which is going to test your knowledge of TOGAF. Okay? It's go you will have to memorize the concepts and ideas, and you'll have to uh, if you understand the concepts thoroughly, you don't have to memorize it, but the point is that it will basically be a test of your knowledge about TOGAF. The level two uh, of the TOGAF certification is about a deeper understanding of TOGAF. Okay, how do you apply the concepts in real world? So this is a complex case study based uh, uh, question paper. There will be eight questions and you will get 90 minutes to answer these eight questions only. It's an open book exam which means that there will be um, um, button on the lower left section of the examination software and you can click on that button, open the book. The, it will give you a scenario of, well, there is an organization ABC and you know it has recently merged with another organization XYZ and, um, uh, and, and, and they have these systems and they're not integrating and what, what are you going to do? So you have to apply the TOGAF knowledge that you have gained through the training and uh, you know try to figure out how, uh, how you will apply enterprise architecture and how you will solve the problem. So yes, to a certain extent it is an exercise. Um, it's, I haven't done Cisco certification to be honest, I would uh, not know what kind of exercises you do in Cisco certification, but you do have some level of uh, uh, you know, exercises in the TOGAF as well. What is the difference? With, uh, so there's another question from Ajay Kumar. He says, what is the difference between PMP and TOGAF? Is there any connectivity uh, uh, between Agile and TOGAF? So, good question, Ajay. I appreciate it. I applaud you for asking that question. Uh, TOGAF framework is um, not very different from, uh, okay, so TOGAF primarily focuses on enterprise architecture. So bringing all the systems together, higher level perspective at business processes, systems, data and technology and, you know, and so on. Agile methodology is an implementation framework. I am an Agile certified practitioner by PM, PMI and I understand Agile well and Agile is an implementation uh, uh, framework. So, you, uh, how would you go ahead and implement a system, right? That is what Agile is. Now, there is also Scaled Agile, which basically looks at portfolio level, okay? TOGAF looks at an even higher level, at an enterprise level. So, enterprise architecture and then you've got strategic architecture, uh, sorry, uh, uh, segment architectures, which are at the portfolio level, which is Scaled Agile frameworks and what have you, SAFE. And then you have capability architectures, which are, um, you know, many, many architectures within the segment architecture, many projects within the portfolio, like, uh, so to speak. Each project can be run using Agile. Now, is there a connection between Agile and TOGAF? Sure is. TOGAF does not compete with other frameworks. It complements them. It aligns with them. So after you have studied the entire enterprise, how would you, you realize the gaps that these are the systems that we need at this point in time? How are you going to implement those systems? Well, you can use Agile if you would like to. You can use Waterfall if you want to. You could use any other system that you want to. But Agile does not stop you from doing that. And in fact, Agile is an iterative methodology. All right? It borrows from... Uh, uh, agile framework and from PMP as far as risk management is concerned and from uh, you know uh, Spivox enterprise management enterprise ma uh, management framework and so on so it borrows there is there is uh, you know uh, it, uh, contribution from various frameworks to build agile framework okay there is also co contribution from capability maturity models uh, to build the so it's a combination of many things it has taken uh, the knowledge from everywhere to build a framework that primarily focuses on, uh, you know, on enterprise architecture. I hope that answers your question, Ajay.
Any other questions, um, suggestions, ideas, thoughts, experiences that you would like to share? Please go ahead. Uh, yes, it is. PMP is a project management methodology, again, similar to uh, uh, Agile. It focuses on the implementation of the projects. Agile, on the other hand, focuses uh, at a higher level on the, on the organization, on the um, you know, enterprise. So there are many, many projects within enterprise architecture. Uh, you can use PMP methodology uh, to, uh, to implement your projects. Could you please heads up on the training and associates cost for, well, that is a question that you must ask the organizers of this webinar. I will not be able to answer those questions. Somebody will get in touch with you uh, on that, okay, uh, about the, the, the training and the uh, associates cost for TOGAF. Any other questions, ideas, suggestions that you would like to make, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, is there any prerequisites uh, is the question. Hold on just a moment. Um, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, sorry. Right. Uh, there are no prerequisites of taking the exam. Uh, I gave my exam even without the training, but it took me about nine months of study. Uh, and it's a very, very boring and dry book. I strongly recommend that you go do a training. It helps you. Under and I did not understand TOGAF when I uh, gave the exam. I, I memorized the ideas and, and, and you know, um, gave the exam. But I was very lucky that I... Uh, was already an enterprise architect before I did TOGAF. Okay, I was um, working on real enterprise architecture projects, and it was easier for me to understand the concepts. Okay, so a training helps you understand the concepts much better, and it opens up many many opportunities for you. Uh, so there is no prerequisites for taking the exam, although it is advisable to you know take a training and give the exam. It also improves your uh, uh, probability of clearing the exam in the first attempt, all right? Um, enterprise architecture is uh, actually wide, rather. Uh, it's very, very wide. Once you become an enterprise architect, it opens up opportunities for you to ultimately become a CIO and then a, a, and an IT head, a CIO, and so on. So uh, it gives you a higher level understanding about IT. So I didn't quite understand. Is there a wider scope for this question? Would you be... Uh, willing to elaborate that a little bit. In the meantime, I'll answer another question by Fazil. Is there any revalidation of TOGAF certification? For example, every X year, so no, there isn't. Uh, so what happens is, if you would have been a TOGAF 8.1.1 certified architect, uh, now the latest version of TOGAF is TOGAF 9. Right, so for the first couple of uh, months, or you know, more than a year actually, more than a couple of years actually, they opened up a something called a bridge exam. So if you're already a TOGAF 8.1 certified architect, you could take a, a bridge exam that essentially covers only those uh, aspects which are new in TOGAF 9. All right, and and, and you could you know uh, clear the exam and become a TOGAF 9 certified. But other than that, so now that you are, this TOGAF 9 is the latest version, if tomorrow there is a TOGAF 10 that comes along, then you, they will obviously create a bridge exam and you can give the bridge exam and clear the TOGAF 10 as well. I don't know for of, uh, any TOGAF 10 work that is happening. There isn't actually, okay, as far as my best knowledge goes. Um, 
However, I cannot guarantee that TOGAF 10 will never come. It's a popular framework. Um, I can see gaps in it, so I'm sure there are many people who can see gaps in it. So there's a good possibility that TOGAF 10 will come in, an, in, in a number of years. Whenever it does, you can take the bridge exam and upgrade. But other than that, there is no refresher exam that you require or revalidation exam that you require within TOGAF. Once you're certified, you're certified. That's it. There are many, um, uh, many, many other um, certifications. So Open Group uh, provides Open Group. Um, I mean, TOGAP certified the Open Group Architecture Framework certification, which is one. And then there is also the Open Group Certified Architect, which is a completely different level. All right, you should. I mean, uh, they recommend that you be TOGAP certified to attempt to become a TOGAF certif uh, certified architect, okay? Uh, sorry, open group certified architect, open CA, they call it. There's also an open uh, certified IT specialist by open group, but it's not related to enterprise architecture, okay? It's generally, uh, you know, IT. There is also the Zachman framework, which uh, I'm, I'm a Zachman certified architect. Uh, the only way that you can do Zachman certification is by taking the Zachman framework certification training <laughs> from John Zachman himself, okay, and he comes to India, uh, I'm from India by the way, so he comes to India um, every year. Uh, I don't know how many trainings he conducts around the world, but uh, the only way that you can get Zachman certified is through Zachman training. So Zachman and Open Group are two popular frameworks. Zachman popular because he, is, uh, John Zachman, who's actually happens to be a good friend uh, because we've met so many times in conferences and all that. Um, he was the father of enterprise architect architecture. Okay, he was the one who coined the term enterprise architecture. So, and he created the Zachman framework. So it's quite popular actually, and it aligns with TOGAF. TOGAF also works with uh, Zachman framework. So, yeah, you could do that, but it has nothing to do with Open Group, though. Okay, it's a completely different certification program. And then there is a Pragmatic Enterprise Architecture Framework and Department of Defense Architecture Framework and, and a Federated Enterprise Architecture Framework and so on and so forth. So there are many frameworks out there, and um, um, you know, so yeah, you can uh, uh, you can do as many as you want to, but Open Group should be a good start, I believe. All right. Uh, Anand Kumar asks me, uh, will I be learning some modeling tool during yoga or it's all about concepts, approaches, and strategies? I will be talking about modeling tools. I will be giving you, uh, if I take the training, I will be giving you ideas about how the modeling tools work. I will be talking about multiple modeling tools, but uh, will not be, you'll not be learning any tools yourself. Uh, you'll only be learning the concepts, approaches, and strategies behind those tools and how those tools are designed. All right, but uh, because these tools are not cheap, they're very, very expensive, and uh, you know, learning a tool itself would be a complete training program after you've done TOGA certification. Okay, um, so uh, no, you will, the short answer is no. You will not be learning any tools. You'll be learning the concepts behind the tools. And I use the analogy of tools to make you understand the concepts of TOGAF, uh, but nothing beyond that. Um, any organization, so Sudhakar asks the question, uh, any organizational standards mandate for certified enterprise architecture presence? Organizational standards. No, uh, so, um, well, if I, I, again, did not quite understand the question, but I, I'm assuming that you're trying to say that uh, to be a TOGAF, I mean, is there something called a TOGAF certified enterprise or TOGAF certified organization? And does uh, open group come and audit whether you're following the standard processes or not, uh, like CMMI and ISO? No, uh, to open group does not work like that. See, open group architecture framework is a recommendation. You cannot implement open group architecture framework as is. It is not possible and it is not advisable. Open Group Architecture Framework itself encourages you to customize the framework according to your organization specific needs. It gives you a higher level um, um, uh, guidelines, it gives you a higher level uh, framework based on which you will design your own enterprise architecture. It is designed for all businesses, it is designed for all domains, all uh, um, um, industries, you know, all, all business models. 
So it, it, it is so generic that you cannot use it as is. Okay, and since you are going to customize it, there's nobody who can come and actually tell you that well you're not using the open group architecture framework, and so you are not an you are not a toga whatever. It, audits do not happen. It just doesn't work like that. Okay, this is a higher level understanding of uh, how enterprise architecture works and how toga works. They give you guidelines and techniques and standards and best practices and all that. But ultimately, uh, using all that knowledge and using all that. Uh, uh, you know, content that is given to you, you build your own enterprise architecture, customized and tailored for your specific needs. All right, that brings us to the end of the session. Um, thank you very much for being a very, very interactive audience. I do really, really appreciate an interactive session because that makes the entire session very, very interesting. Um, if you have any further questions, you can get in touch with the organizers of the webinar. I'm sure you must have received an email invite to the uh, uh, webinar. Um, you will find all the details about who to contact and how in that email. Please get in touch with the organizers if you have any questions or if you have an interest in taking the TOGA certification. All right? Um, thank you, everybody, and have a good day ahead. Bye-bye.